Okay, I guess I'll start then. Hi, everyone. Hi, everyone. You can say Privyet, Stasvitya, whatever, whatever you guys say, it's okay. Thank you for having me. Uh, I'm Sawyer. I'm going to talk about uh, web scrapers. And web scraping is a topic that I really like, and I'm very happy that I get to talk to you about this. It's probably the first thing that I've ever done with Perl. It's probably going to be the last thing that I'm going to do with Perl because it's a lot of fun. I really enjoy it. And um, I wanted to give a talk about the different stuff that I do with web scraping and what it means and how it works and what kind of tools we have and how I suggest using it and all these things. Um, and uh, because I don't have a very good talk about it, I actually i am going to give this talk instead, which is like this, but just not as good. So I think the first thing when we talk about web scrapers is actually to understand what those are. And uh, not everyone knows what it is. Not everyone's sure what it is. Some people think they might be wrong. Um, so I think we kind of uh, start from the same place by knowing what those are. So to illustrate web scraper, this, this is a, a skyscraper. Okay, and you might get a feeling of what that means. Um, this one is a regular scraper; we just scrape stuff. This one is a, a this is a spatula. And never mind. Let's off topic. What is a web scraper really? Um, a web scraper is basically an application that fetches a web page, analyzes the web page, and gives you the information that is designed, uh, inside that web page. For example, this very common HTML page that has the current day. And suppose you have this page, and you want to fetch something from it. Tuesday, right? And you want to get which day is it today, because otherwise, how would you know? So a common thing to do would be create a, a request. This is an example of code that represents a request. It doesn't actually make a request. It just represents one. We're using HTTP request, create a new object with the method get on the URL example.com, and we get back a request object. Now that we have something representing the request, we can actually initiate one, um, fetch the page using LWP user agent, which is a user agent, basically like a browser. And we call request on it, which says, I have some kind of representation of a request. I want you to actually go and fetch it. We give it the request that we have, and we get back a response that represents what was uh, received from the server. It will be of type HTTP response. And then we analyze it uh, and extract the information. Because it's Perl, we're going to do it in one step. Um, the first thing that we do is use the response to get the decoded content. Then we match it on some regex to find the day. We capture it. And um, if it works, we're going to print it out with $1 there that represents the day that we got. Very simple. This is our very, our very own first web scraper. Now, um, there's a few things that we can actually improve here. The first thing that we'll do, it's very simple. Do you see the get over there? Get is actually, um, we can specify any method we want. But because these, these methods are very common, user agent, um, LWP user agent allows you to call not just request with a general request, but also on a specific method. So we can change it to get. And then we take the URL, and we just throw the URL into get, and then we don't need this thing. So it's a bit shorter. It's a bit nicer. Um, so first step, write out scraper. Done. It's really good. Next step, uh, to continue. OK, so uh, why do we need to write web scrapers? Why do we have this? The first reason is that a website might not have an API. Everyone's familiar with uh, uh, APIs, which are basically our interface to the information that's available on a website. But a website might not have one. And there are multiple reasons for that. The first one is whoever wrote the website didn't think about writing an API. It's possible that they didn't know how to write one. Uh, maybe they're using some kind of CMS. Um, and that one doesn't have an API, or you can write one to it, and they don't know how. So they know what it is, but they don't really know how to, how to provide one. It's possible that they don't want to have one. There's a lot of websites that they don't assume that they will need an API, that someone will actually use it. I have a gallery. It has a bunch of pictures. I'm done. If you want to see the pictures, you go in the gallery. That's it. Why would you ever need an API? Um, a lot of um, my first scrapers were to download comics. Because they didn't think about providing an API, but I wanted my copies of the comics. So um, they didn't have an API. I had to scrape the entire website. Now, on the other hand, it's possible that a website might have an API, but there's a few problems with it. For example, the API might have limitations. Um, the number of requests that you can run, the number of uh, the, the details that you can get, and all of these things. And it can be very, very annoying. It's possible that it doesn't cover everything. 
a website might have uh, a list of products, but then the recommendations are uh, available using an engine. If you go to the website, you'll see recommendations. But if you go to the API, you don't see recommendations, which is very, very annoying, because you actually want the recommendations as well. But it's not in the API. So it, it, to get recommendations, you have to go to a different engine, if it's even available. It's possible that the API is not comfortable, <coughs> Google. And um, the, the API might be very, very annoying. Um, uh, tricky, doesn't make any sense, eBay. Um, it's, it's um, you know, all, all of these uh, uh, websites, PayPal, whatever, they, they, they shitty APIs. It's possible that it requires authentication or authorization, whereas you have to register, you get a token, you have a user and a password and the token, and you need to pay for it maybe, you know, it costs money, and then you go through a world of shit just to try and get some information. And oftentimes, we're not using it to get any money, we just want to check stuff out, and then we, oh, you want to search for apartments, no, you need to register and pay a bunch of money just because you don't want to click refresh a, a thousand times. And that happens a lot, it's really annoying. So it has an API, but you don't want to go through the API because it puts just hurdles in your way. Now, of course, why not? I usually say why, but then people ask, well, why wouldn't we want to write an API? HTML can change. That's basically it. Um, an API, uh, a scraper, I'm sorry. Uh, a scraper goes through the HTML. HTML might change. They added a plugin. They changed the theme. They changed the design. They, had, they, they changed the CMS itself. They, they added another element. They restructured the page, fuck, whatever. So HTML can change, and sometimes can change often. So it might break. On the other hand, APIs change quite a lot to <coughs> Google. So. Uh, don't be worried too much about this. APIs actually do change often as well. All right, so moving on, uh, we know what an, uh, a web scraper is. We know why we want to write one, why uh, or when we would like to avoid one. But how do we actually write one? Taking a look back at what we wrote, which was this beautiful, lovely web scraper. Um, it, it's, it's actually horrible. It, it is, it, it's very ugly. This is the first thing that people think about. Like, am I, I'm going to have to write that code like over like this thing? The good news are no. It isn't like that uh, when you start writing serious um, web scrapers. So what I'm going to do is show you a few tools of the trade. But I should actually um, phrase it better. I'm going to show you my tools of the trade. Every once in a while, someone comes over and says, why don't you use this? There's probably a reason. If there's a tool that you like, feel free to use it. And if you don't know why it included, there's probably a good reason. Come see me after. So, I'm going to show two basic tools. The first one is www.mechanize, which is basically a browser and an object. The other one, which I'm going to focus more on, is WebQuery, which is a jQuery-esque and perlesque. Uh, it's a jQuery-like uh, scraper. It's very comfortable, very nice. Um, and I'm going to focus a lot on that one. So starting with Mechanize. Mechanize, like I said, is a browser in an object. And what I mean by browser in an object is that it has state. It understands what state it is in, uh, what um, part of the website you're on, and it thinks like a browser. It has credentials, a username, password, stuff like that. It has uh, understanding of cookies, and it supports uh, storing the cookies and, and working on them. Um, it has supports for forms. It analyzes forms. It says, oh, you want to submit the form. What is the name of the form? What is the number of the form? What are the fields? And it just submits a form just like you would on a website. It has understanding of links, so it analyzes all of them. It tells you these are the links available on the website, and you can click them. And there's an image uh, uh, parsing part where it understands images and, and even has a back button. If there's anything that tries to convince you this thinks like a browser, it has a back button. It has a reload option. Um, it really does think like a browser, which is very, very useful. The best usage for Mechanize is uh, writing a web crawler. When you actually want to go through a website and click this, click that, uh, hit this form, uh, press this button, and you literally have like click button and stuff like that. So it's very useful for web crawlers. I'll give you a quick example from actual code that we've used. Um, this generates a new www.mechanized object, and it fetches the web page. It's very similar to user agent, where we just call get and a URL. The reason is that it's actually based on LWP user agent, but it's much smarter. So uh, new object, we call get just like before. We give a URL just like before. And you'll notice that we don't actually have a response back. We didn't say my response equals, just like we did with user agent, with uh, LWP user agent. The reason is that, like I said, it has state. The mech object there, once you do a get, remembers what you did a get to, and it has the current response. It actually remembers those things. It has state. 
Now, you might still want to get a response object back. You can just say the same thing that we did before, and it will be in both. So same thing. Now, you can have post just like you can have get, where you give a URL, um, and you give some parameters. Currently, we're not having any parameters in there, but we can add. Um, this is an example of submitting um, a post request with um, a username and a password as the parameters. If this is in a form, you might actually write um, Providing the fields, you might actually use submit form, and then you give the form name and the fields and stuff like that. But the post is an example because I actually want to build on it. You can get all the links like this, find all links, and then you get links, and they're all. This is really cool. You can actually uh, splice them and say, well, I only want links that have a certain URL that matches a certain regex. Not difficult at all. You give URL uh, regex, and it actually tries to match it. And what you get back is uh, links. Each one is an object of dub 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 mechanized link, which actually contains all of the parameter, all of the properties of a link, like the base, the URL, the, the name of it, all of that stuff. So let's build with that a little bit. Suppose we have a post and we run a post on the URL for each link that we find. So we just do a for there, and we call the URL on it to get the URL of the link object, and we do a post, and. No parameters, but we should probably add some. So this will be a parameters, uh, EID and MID. Um, and then we can just provide params. We'll fill in the rest of the stuff. So what we have here is a mechanized object, gets a main page, has some parameters, gets all the links that match a certain URL, and then for each one of them runs a post with those parameters. This is actual code that we used to, well, I, I should qualify we. We is me and another person at a hackathon. Uh, we were kind of bored, and we faked elections of a competition with this. It's very nice. Um, because you could just, if you wanted to vote for someone, you just needed to submit a request with their ID and your ID. And it was all sequential numbers, so we just ran random voting. Um, and it worked. It was really funny. And at some point, they canceled the competition because of it. So that was a lot of fun. Um, so kind of cleaning that up a bit, we'll take this. The first thing I'm going to do is move all of the uh, find all links down there. So now it's for and find all links. But I, I don't like this. I don't like writing code that is just very, very long that you have to read like this. So um, we'll split it down a little bit, uh, a new line there. And uh, the parameters we can stick right in there as well. So a bit nicer, right? It's a better uh, crawler. And now I'm going to move to web query, where I'm actually going to focus the most on. This talk was mainly, I want to show you this, but I had to wrap up with other stuff. So <laughs> we're done with the wrappers. I want to focus mainly on this. Web Query is my new favorite tool. I really, really, really like Web Query. Uh, it is a scraper. It has a jQuery interface. If you're familiar with jQuery, this will seem um, uh, very familiar. And if not, don't worry. It, has, uh, it is selector-based, so it actually identifies item by their classes and IDs and stuff like that. It was written by Tokihiro Masuno, uh, an amazing Japanese hacker. So it is full of, of Japanese hacker awesomeness. If you've ever worked with, uh, or co of, worked with code of uh, Japanese hackers, they are crazy good. And they are really, really bright and smart and interesting, and their code is amazing. So it's, it's like full of like, craziness. Um, and recently, a person named Yannick Shampo, who's uh, uh, an amazing uh, person, he's also a core dev and dancer, um, got a commit bit. So just watch out. It's going to get crazier. So it's full of like awesome things. Let me give you an example of this. Assuming we have this page, the HTML 401 specification, which we all read, right? Everyone read this? Who read this? Raise your hand. Who read this 17 times? Just me? All right. Oh, there we go. Thank you. All right. So we, we've all read this, obviously. We, we wouldn't get our jobs if we didn't. So assuming we want to grab something from this, let's say um, the titles over there, so kind of these things. I'm picking it random. Somehow it highlighted exactly what I thought of. And we can write a web scraper for it. Let's uh, take a look. The first thing we're going to do is use WQ, which is short for Web Query. This is the function that does the majority of the work. We're going to give it um, a URL. And Web Query accepts two things, either a URL or some kind of HTML content. If it's uh, HTML content, it will start going through it. If it's uh, a URL, it will fetch that and then go through it. So we'll start with the HTML itself. So Web Query, 
the URL itself. And now we want to start going through that HTML and finding bits and pieces and get out of it. So the, the first thing that we do is going to call find. And what we're going to get find is a selector, basically classes or IDs, stuff to pick out. We're going to start with a div. That will match every div that it can find. This is an example of something it will find. Because it's a div, it will match it. Now, that's actually not the div that we want. So we kind of want to narrow that down. Um, of course, once it gets it, it will get the content over there. But to narrow it down, we're going to add dot head, basically saying every div that has a class head. So this is a div, and it has a class head, which will work. Then we're going to go to the DT inside. Um, this will match any DT element. And then what we want to do is go over each one of those DTs. Each DT is one of those titles that you saw highlighted. So we're going to go over each one of those using something surprisingly um, or surprisingly named each. And each goes over each element, and then runs a subroutine on that element. The first thing that we get in that subroutine is the index. Okay, So we do a shift. We get an index, and that index will start from 0. So each time each is run, that index will be the next number of the element that we found, starting from 0, 0, 1, 2, 3, whatever. Then we're printing out. Um, a number and a string, which will be the index plus one because it's humanly readable. And then we're going to use dollar underscore text. Dollar underscore is a web query object. Now, that web query object has an attribute text. So if this is the object, this is what it represents, text will match this part of it, the, the text part of it. So if we have this and we do a find, um, div was matched here. Then head matched this one. Then um, this entire thing matched, and we can move on to DT. When we do it each, we actually go over each one of those. And then if we go inside of it, and this would be dollar underscore text will actually be the content of each one. So this entire thing is the code. And it prints out this. And you can clearly see the part of the index matching the index over there, and dollar underscore text, which matches this version will be this version and all the rest of the content. That's it. Moving on. Some more interesting things. Once I started using Web Query, I was thinking about stuff that I could do with this. Now, I listen to a lot of audiobooks. I listen to a lot of podcasts. I really like podcasts. And I thought, well, I could download these podcasts. I have a Sansa Clip. I don't have any iPod or any iTunes devices, any Apple stuff, actually. And um, I actually listen on an MP3 player that I bought like, like years ago, and it's still running. And I love it. And I download stuff, and I listen to them. And I thought, I want to download this. I don't want to run it streaming. So I thought, I could probably download some stuff. There are two things that I started with, two podcasts. The first one is with the same typo that I keep forgetting. Welcome to Night Vale. Uh, it's a podcast. Um, it's like a really weird one. Um, and this is their page if you want to download anything. Um, you have the episodes and their titles, and you have buttons for listening. And when you click listening, it doesn't actually start playing it. it. It goes to another page, which then shows you that specific one. And then you can like it, tweet it, listen, or you can download it right there. So that's the first thing that I wanted to do. So let's see how we can do this. The first uh, part is to run Web Query to get that page. Then inside it, I search for a table, but in just one, one table. So I expanded to a table that has a class table um, stripe, because it's in stripes. Then I go into the T body, the table body. Then I go over each row. And now for each row, I need to get these columns, where one column was the title and one column was the download uh, page uh, link. So I'll start with the title. Uh, just find the first uh, TD with the link and get me the text of it. That's the title. That's it. Then, uh, of course, check if a file exists. Very, very important. Um, so. I got the, uh, the file name, and I check if it exists. Then I get the link to it, which would be the last one. So I find the first table item that has a link that has a class button, because that's how they did the, the, the kind of CSS styling for the button. And from there, I take the href attribute to get the link. Then I can go to the link using WQ again. 
and inside it find the right div that has an ID download and take the button from there and then I get the link from there and then I can use IO all to just download it. So I just do IO and a link to IO and a file name and it downloads the entire thing, which is very nice. And obviously at the end you have to print that you're done. All right, so that was the first thing that I did. The next one is called Criminal. It's another podcast. It's much less weird. It deals with criminology. It was a, chop a topic I find very interesting. It looks like this. Um, it's actually a WordPress blog style website. And um, you have to go through each one of these. And then for each one of these, there's a page for it. Uh, it has the, the um, SoundCloud iframe. And in it, it loads. And it's like a bunch of JavaScript and stuff like that. What I do want to show you is the first thing that really pissed me off, which was, it, it, I don't know if you see this, the title is in, in, in words, but the, the, num the number of the episode is as well. It doesn't say 1, 5, or 15. It says 15. So it's very annoying when you want to sort numerically. And then this is how each post looks like, where you have the SoundCloud thing. This is entirely an iframe. And it loads a bunch of stuff, and then it goes and asks for it. Um, I try to, to do that, and it uses an API. And you have to register for the API, which is another example of when you would want to avoid APIs. And it was very, very difficult, because I don't remember my browser registering for an API. And I didn't want to pay the money to register for an API just to download it. So I kind of looked inside it a little bit. And what I found is that the iframe uh, asks for some JavaScript that when you load it, it downloads something. And then inside it, somewhere in this weird structure, there's a public key. You just have to find it. It looks like this. It actually goes there. API SoundCloud tracks the track number download. And you have to get, to get that client ID. So how do I do this? The first thing is go in, get each post. What I didn't show you before was the second parameter that you get in an each. The, the first parameter in each is the number. The second parameter is in an each is dollar underscore. It is the web query object. And um, it is um, another way to get this, but while giving it a name instead of using dollar underscore, because maybe you want to call WQ multiple times, and you don't want to use dollar underscore and close over dollar underscore, which will get overwritten. and. Uh, so you give it a name. So the first thing that I do is find the header that I want with the link that I want. Then I have to remove a Unicode right quotation mark, because one episode had a quotation mark and converted it to Unicode, and then it's a different quotation mark, and it looks shitty on my shell. So renaming. Then I get the link. I skip the live show, because you can't actually download that. Then I do something really nice where I look for the episode and grab the text that represents the number of the episode in letters, and then the episode name. Then I'm using words to nums all the way up there from lingua English words to nums, which translates the, the letters and the words into actual digits and numbers. And I add uh, the, the file name, so I get an entire file name. I love, I love Perl. It's like a regex that matches, captures two, runs some code, concatenates, and provides me with a file name. Pretty good, pretty good. Um, so uh, after that, I print out the uh, count, um, the book talk about uh, the talk about books, Pearl Secrets, and the baby troller. There, I'm using it here. Of course, check if the file exists. Then to get the link, I go to the content. I look for the iframe. I go to the source of the iframe. I fetch the iframe. Um, and then um, after I fetch the iframe, I have to download the JavaScript that it links to. I have to find the key. You'll notice that I'm escaping some stuff here, because sometimes it's escaped, sometimes it isn't. Uh, over here, sorry. So sometimes it's percent %2f, sometimes it's not. It's kind of weird. Uh, thank you, SoundCloud. And unfortunately, this doesn't show the entire thing. Yeah, well, this is just the I.O. Uh, line to, to download it, which is basically it. Now, after I did this entire thing, I wrote a blog post. Uh, I wrote two blog posts uh, talking about how I did this. I was very excited about this. And then I got uh, a tweet from Miyagawa. And Miyagawa said, is there a reason you're not going to the RSS feed 
that has direct MP3 links to download. You just go there and you click. And I thought about it and said, well, it, it, it's a learning experience. It, it, I had to study. <laughs> it's like, okay, that's a good reason. So let's move on from, from my learning experience. Um, there's a website called schema.org that Getty showed me. Schema.org has uh, a bunch of these schemas for random things. It's meant to make the, the, web, uh, the, the World Wide Web more accessible. So this is an example of an event. And you can see at the top that an event is already a thing. Um, an event has an attendee and a door time and duration, when it stops, the status, location, all these things. And each one is its own kind of class. So um, an attendee is an entity of a person or an organization. Um, a performer is another person or organization. The, there's the recorded in and then the creative work and then there's a start date, which is a date. There's a sub-event, which is another event and so on. And this is very helpful if you're trying to write some, some system that has some objects and you want to define them in a way that a lot of people have already thought about. The only problem uh, with this website that a bunch of really big companies made to make the web more accessible is that this information is completely inaccessible. Completely. There is, um, this is something that is very hard. You can't download it. Uh, it's very annoying. You have to sit down and write it yourself. Um, there is one uh, full page that shows the hierarchy between all of these things, and it's not up to date. And they say it. We're not keeping it up to date. Then why do you have it? So it's very annoying. And I thought about this, and I, I, I told Getty, I want to I use this, and I want to create automatic Moose classes from this. And he said, no, this is, this is too much work. You're going to have to. You, you wouldn't be able to scrape it easily. Well, this is the entire code. That's it. It's very simple. Um, actually, it wasn't a lot of work, but that's not that that's not that interesting. More interesting, I was thinking about um, useful cases for web scraping. In the Netherlands, where I live right now, there's a lot of uh, recycling, and um, each recycling is in a different day, and it's not always the same day. It really depends, and every year you get uh, a paper that shows you which days what is being recycled and picked up, and you have to take it out uh, to the curb. And I, I, it, what I do is have it on my calendar, because otherwise I'll forget. My calendar has automatic notifications, because otherwise, otherwise I won't even look in the calendar. And I had to go through the page and just write down everything in the calendar, which is really, really annoying. And then I thought, there's probably, uh, maybe I can find it online. I did find it online. There is a website that you can use where you put in your postcode, and you put in your house number. Um, this says postcode, and this says house number. And this is how it looks like in um, Dutch. I don't, I don't understand Dutch. I don't know Dutch. This is how it looks like in English. And you can see that it has the months over at the top. And there is each day and what is being um, recycled. And this is pair your zip code and your house number. That's how they know. And I wanted to download this. So oh, you might have seen that there's a PDF button. The PDF doesn't work. OK. So what do we do? First, I have some parameters. I run WQ on it, find the part that I want. For each one, I get the year and the month. I print out the year. Um, I'm using P underscore year just to make sure that I don't print it twice. It's just a nice Boolean check. I find inside it, get the day number and the day name, and what is actually being recycled, which is the uh, AFAL description. And then I print that out, again, with a baby tr stroller card thingy. That's it. Um, so that was, that was a trash pickup, which is really nice, because now I can hook it up to my calendar and, and throw it out there, because it has an API and stuff like that. It's very nice. But I was thinking, could I do more? Um, well, I, I probably could do more. Yes, I want to do more. So async is a big word. Async, async, async. I really like asynchronous programming. I do a lot of asynchronous programming. I was wondering, would I be able to get Web Query to run with any event? Yes. Uh, the first thing that I wanted to get are the streets in my um, municipality uh, near Amsterdam, where I live. Now, the reason I wanted to get the streets is not, uh, not because I'm really interested in streets. I just found it as an interesting example. Um, if you take a look at the municipality website in Amstelfane, you'll see that they just have a list of all the streets, their names, their history, what neighborhood they're in, like really weird 
stuff. Um, I guess if you're doing a, a, a uh, street tour around the city, I don't know. But I thought about this, and I could actually use each letter here and run an asynchronous request for each header, paralyzing the requests for each letter and getting all of the streets in that letter at the same time instead of sequentially. So um, if I enter each letter, it looks like this, where I have the street at the top. I think that's the neighborhood, and then the entire description. Of course, I, I can't read this. It's in Dutch. But maybe go through translator. So um, all the streets in Amstel fame. First thing I do is have, and I'm going to go through this a bit slower, because it's a bit more complicated. So the first one is the URL of the municipality website. Then I create a convar. And that convar will be used in order to determine whether I have more work to do or not. I start with WQ, going over the, the page for the streets, and look for each letter. For each letter that I find, I now need to parallelize the requests. I get the letter link. I print that out. I call begin. And when you call begin in a convar, what it actually does is says, I am waiting for a request to end. If I call begin twice, I'm going to have to wait for two to end. And there is a way to say, well, I'm done. One has ended. And then you can actually ask it, wait until all of them come back. So I can call begin multiple times. It runs stuff in the background. Each, each time one of them is done, I'll say, well, this ended. And wait till I reach zero. So it's a counter that goes up, and then I have to slowly bring it down every time I get a response until it goes back to zero. When it goes to back to zero, I know that I got a response from all of the letters. So now I make a request using any event, HTTP, for the page that has the letter. I get the body back. And because WQ runs not only on links, but also on HTML content, first of all, uh, I call end, saying this request is done. And then I can say, run on whatever content I got back and find inside it all of these things. This will be the street names. This will be the neighborhoods. This will be the descriptions. In this case, I'm using map in order to run something on each element it finds. So it's a map. And then I just push all of them into the streets uh, array that I have there. And at the end, which unfortunately you can't see, there's a, um, a um, receive. And that receive basically says, we've done a bunch of begins. Now wait until we do end on each and every one of those. So for every request that we ran, I want you to wait until they all come back and we're done with all of them. Does anyone have any questions about this, by the way? None? Really? Fantastic. All right. I'm doing really fast on time. Damn it. All right. So the next thing that I was looking at, um, does anyone know what the pull request challenge is? Anyone? Really? One, two, three. All right. Well, here's the thing. Um, so Neil Bauer has a thing called the pull request challenge. All you do is email him, and he assigns you each month a distribution from CPAN that is on GitHub. Your task for that month is to produce at least one pull request for whatever it is you want. That's it. That's the challenge. The challenge is to produce each month at least one pull request for a distribution that you get assigned automatically. And you can, of course, say, well, I don't want to work on this one, or it's kind of dead, or this author is a jerk, or I don't know. And you will get another one. But the idea is that you, we just keep contributing. We add more stuff. And it's a lot of fun. A lot of people are now participating in this. This is an example of a page you put up the first one, January. And you can see um, who is um, getting the re pull request and what distribution it is, who did the last release, wh where's the repo, the number of pull requests waiting, and stuff like that. And it's really, really nice, except it's not very accessible. The problem I had is that I wanted to know how many people got my distributions, which happens. Um, and uh, I, I had to search through this, and it's not comfortable. And it, it even pages it. So it's like 20 at a time, 50 at a time, 100 at a time. So scraping it, the first thing I do is call WQ body. For each row, I need to analyze that row. 
Um, inside it, I find the link for the release. Inside it, I get for that release, uh, I actually check if f two different fields. One was, am I the last person who released it? And two is, is it mine? Which are two different things in CPAN. So I check both of these. And if it is, I print it out, which is very nice. And then I saw, hey, this guy was assigned with module starter, which I'm in charge of. So this was nice, but I thought I could probably do more than this. I work with a bunch of people at booking.com. So if you use Acme CPAN authors, you actually get the, the pause ID of a bunch of people. And there are different categories. There's Acme CPAN authors, I don't know, random things. There's one for like people who have pictures of cats in their name, I think, or in their, in their uh, picture there. So, there's a bunch of these different things, but there's also one uh, Acme CPAN Authors Booking, which gives the pause ID of all the people that I work with, um, which Abigail maintains. So if I try to do that using this, I actually get this output and says, oh, look at that. Uh, this guy was uh, assigned with Eve stuff, or with uh, Ivar's stuff, or with Steven's stuff, it's Steven Little there, uh, who I now work with. And this is a nicer picture, much easier, and then I can see who was assigned with what. And Stephen was assigned with two things that he didn't remember he even wrote. Uh, Ivar was assigned two things that he doesn't maintain anymore. So it's, it's a lot of fun stuff. Then I thought, well, can I do more than this? Can I push it further? Let's take web query. Let's add the answer to. Let's add an event. So now we're getting uh, a web scraper with a web framework and an asynchronous framework as well, an event loop. So what can I do with all of these things? And I like to work with all of them. So I was thinking, uh, maybe I can mesh them together. So first we load all of them. Uh, the answer to, to get um, an interface going, any event in any event is HTTP, in order to run some requests in any event uh, asynchronously in HTTP, and then we'll query to, to um, scrape. And what I thought about doing is produce an interface in Dancer, a JSON API, to the recycling dates in my municipality that is not accessible, but to make it accessible asynchronously with a web API that in the background actually does scraping, which I think is a good example. It looks like this. All the parameters are now changed to post, uh, to, um, to a get, so HTTP parameters, the post is here, the house is here. Delayed causes a, an asynchronous request in Dancer. I'm sorry, an asynchronous response, where what it does is actually say, I want to return asynchronously, but I want this thread to also support other users coming in on a single thread. And you, all, all you need to do is call delayed. Inside delayed, I run a request that is deferred, that will take longer without stalling the user. I use HTTP GET here from any event HTTP. I have the URL for, uh, that I want to reach. Then for the response of that, I use delayed again instead of the sub that you usually have, because delayed accepts a sub. It just causes that sub to be delayed, to be deferred. Um, URL delayed. And then what I do is, at the end, when I'm done with this, I'm going to push content to the user using the content keyword. I'm going to serialize it to JSON. And I'm going to call done on it. And what done does is actually close the socket. So you could still asynchronously clean things up after you do this. And the user uh, won't be bothered because it closes the socket. <clears throat> call WQ on it. Find the stuff that I want. And this is basically the stuff that we saw before. The only difference is that instead of printing it now, I'm saving it to the result. So you can see over here, I don't know if anyone can see probably not. Over here, the result is the one at the top there. Once I'm done uh, going through the content that I have, which is what dollar underscore bracket zero, the first parameter from HTTP get, represents, I go through the entire thing. I fill in result. I have it over there. And then at the end, I push that result, serializing to JSON through the stream to the user, and close it. So before I go to the conclusion, what's happening here is something I found quite, quite interesting. It's taking a website that has information that we actually want that is completely inaccessible and providing a REST interface to it. Well, maybe it's not REST, but it is um, uh, a JSON API to it. 
asynchronously. So we took this website that you can't access. We now made an API that you can reach, and it will asynchronously fetch it and parse it and throw back the result, which is very, very nice. Does anyone have any questions about this before I wrap up? Unfortunately, really early, which actually is unfortunately for you, but very fortunate for you. Does anyone have any questions? No. OK. So in conclusion, it's pretty much the, the, um, the point that I want to um, uh, get across in this talk. The purpose of web scraping eventually is to have automation to provide a way to automate stuff that you want to do over and over again without having to go to the website and clicking stuff. Um, it's very nice uh, when I, I writing a cron that checks a delivery that I needed every day so I won't have to go on and see if it was finally delivered and all that stuff. And it is to transform displayable information, something that you can see, into accessible data that you can actually use. And that's a big difference. And uh, of course, the, uh, above all, the, the best reason to web scrape is actually to have fun, which is what, why I do it and what I do with it all the time. Thank you. <laughs> now, we do have a ton of time. Does anyone have any questions? And you can ask in Russian as long as someone else is willing to translate for me. I can in, in English and Russian as you wish. Go. Okay, in English. Just scream. Okay, okay. Uh, how, how do you scrape uh, websites with uh, JavaScript code that generates some content? You, you understand? The yes. Um, so it's not so easy, I guess. That's a very good question. Yes. I'll repeat the question. The question was, how do you scrape a website that has JavaScript code that actually runs some stuff and gets results? And Yeah. So um, that's probably the, the most frequently asked question. It's very good. Um, so usually the answer that I give is that um, um, Father Chrysostomos, who's a core dev, actually wrote a JavaScript engine implemented in Perl, and it's on CPEN. I think it's called JE, I think. And there is a plugin for the, the plugin for Mechanized that actually uses that, I think. Um, but I haven't used any of them. <laughs> and the reason is that usually what I find most comfortable is to understand what the JavaScript does and do, and do it. JavaScript is not that complicated. Um, usually I haven't seen crazy stuff done with it. Um, it usually transforms the stuff and runs a different request, and that's all. That's basically what JavaScript does. Um, information that it has to display is either something that it received in the first request or it ran another request and got what it wanted to display. And rarely you would get something that uses JavaScript to transform it from an unreadable format to a readable format, but then you can reverse engineer that. I, I haven't scraped much stuff that was really awkward to read, and then you had to kind of reverse engineer that entire concept, but then maybe you would use the JavaScript engine. Uh, which I haven't had to use yet. Does that answer your question? Do you, do you want to ask another one? It's like, eh, eh. some some sites are made completely in JavaScript. Sorry. Some some websites are made completely in JavaScript, so you have to well to parse everything. Well, I, right? I will say I've never scraped those, so I I fail to give you an exact example of how we tackle those, because I've never had to do this. Um, I've never found JavaScript to be a serious challenge. Um, I, I might. <laughs> right. Louder. Hello. <laughs> uh, what do you uh, think about uh, scraping uh, using regex, not uh, DOM parsing? Uh, OK, so DOM parsing using regex. You are a brave individual. If I may say so, sir. Um, there's a, a phrase, um, you know, I had a problem, then I decided to use regular expression, now I have two. And the, the problem with regular expressions is that um, as rich as they are, they were not meant to, to, be, um, um, to be entire grammars. And you could use them as grammars, but you would, ha you would know what you're doing if you're at that point. Uh, HTML, SGML, 
these are structures that are much better fit to use a, a normal parser instead of pattern matching. Now, I will say that I have used regex quite a bit. I wouldn't put it in production, though, um, because it works for that small, nice thing that I'm doing. And as long as no one looks at it, it's great. But I wouldn't put it in production. There's a lot of companies who are actually using scraping right now to access bits of information that is, that is not available and to aggregate different information. That's their service. There's a lot of companies that do that. Like there's a website, and you want to access a ton of these same kind of service websites, and you want to aggregate that service, but most of them don't have an API. So your entire, um, your entire business is providing one common API to all of them, and that's very, very cool. And you might have to use some, some uh, crawlers and scrapers to do that. Regex would probably not be the best solution there because it could break more easily. Um, there, there are more edge cases in regex, um, and HTML is just produced in so many different ways, um, and most of them don't actually even do it right, which is terrible. So, but what about sites? Uh, what about sites with a broken HTML? Yes, there are situations which, I guess, a, a, a regex parser would help. But you got to remember that it's not what it's meant for. It's pattern matching. It's not a full parser. You can go nuts with it and write a full parser, but that's not the strength of it. And it might work in some situations, but I would try to do it without. And if I really, really, really can't, I will use it just where I have to. So. OK. I get it. Thank you. Yeah, I, I can barely hear, so I have no idea what you said. <laughs> Is that OK? All right. Thank you for louder. <laughs> I'm going to yell at everyone now. Thank you. Uh, what you could say about Statushika Miyagawa web scraper? Do you use it? The, the Miyagawa you, scraper? Yes. Do you find it uh, better for some uh, tasks? So, OK, yeah, that's a good question. Uh, Miyagawa has written his own scraper a while ago, um, and I've actually used it. It was a bit trickier for me to, to understand because it has different syntax. Um, I don't come from a JavaScript background, but WebQuery kind of felt right. But I went to WebQuery because Miyagawa recommended it. So I worked with Miyagawa's one, and then I asked him some questions. He's like, you know what? I'm not really continuing development on it. Wait, just take a look at this one instead. You might like it better. Um, and I always listen to what Miyagawa says. Like, you have to. Um, so Thank you. No problem. Does anyone else? Oh, yes. Uh, most of the commercial websites forbid uh, this kind of techniques. Do you honor it? Like uh, it's made for a reason, like uh, automation and other stuff. I'm sorry, I didn't. I, I, I'm not sure um, I understand. Mo most of the commercial sites uh, forbid this kind of techniques, like automation, uh, gathering information. Do you honor it, and what do you think about it? Um, well, the, the biggest problem that you might have with a business that does this is that most websites do not allow you to legally scrape them. Any, uh, almost all websites have a, a common clause in their agreement, which I'm pretty sure is like fucking copy-pasted from each other, uh, that says that automation is not allowed. Um, I, I had a talk in the past on asynchronous programming in which I, sh in which I, s I was talking about how I would love to um, I stay up at night, and I can't sleep sometimes. And then I, 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 when I take a look at this is like completely off topic, but, but it will eventually make sense. Um, I have a lot of time, so I'm going to. So um, I, when you see a TV show, and you kind of see the same character in multiple TV shows, and you recognize them, and it, your mind starts wondering, where have I seen this person before? So I wrote in, I, well, I wouldn't. Um, I wanted to write a script that goes through IMDb and kind of cross-references them so I can find who was in which show. And I had a talk about asynchronous programming in which I said, well, I would love to write this, but that would be illegal that would, uh, against IMDb. And then if I had written it, this is the entire code. And I had code that would theoretically work, but I can't legally uh, write it. And I think a lot of websites depend on this kind of thing, which is shaky from a legal perspective. Like, it's not all legal. You can't always scrape the websites. Um, and then, uh, you know, there's, there's detection, and maybe you want to scrape and randomly sleep in between. <laughs> it's like a whole mess. Um, 
I had a client a, a long time ago who wanted to uh, gather a database from some supermarket. And um, it was like to go over all of the products in every single page and get all of the statistics for it and download it. And it was a nice idea commercially. Was it legal? I'm not sure. Um, I didn't write it, uh, allegedly. Um, so I, I'm not against it. I think the problem is that people don't make APIs accessible. They don't, make them, they don't plan APIs correctly. They, they do shitty work, and then you have to go around it. And it's a problem. Um, if to load the website that gives me all the information, I don't need a password. Why would I need a password to, um, to, to load it from a script, you know? It's, it's kind of shitty. Um, I understand companies that do this. I'm not against it. I, I enjoy scraping. Any other questions? Yes. Yes, sir. Loud. You use, uh, you use web query uh, for... Do, do I use what? I'm sorry? Uh, web query uh, for extract some information from uh, the web page. Uh, did you ever use uh, uh, XPath uh, for this? Uh, and uh, what do you think, uh, which is better? Um, whatever you find most, most comfortable. I don't use XPath, uh, but I would never look at your code and go, oh my god, you're using XPath, what are you doing? If, if it works and you find it comfortable, go, go nuts. That's, it's, it's a very valid way of doing it. I'm just not good at it. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, anyone else? Yes. Louder. I use the uh, <laughs> Phantom JS for web scraping. Uh, it's a real browser, headless browser. You can run it as a server, yeah. and it exposes uh, Selenium API. Selenium yeah, I know. I know Phantom JS. And uh, I use the Perl module for Selenium API, and uh, I could get, for example, an image of a web page and such and such. And it it interprets JavaScript. Yes, I I know Phantom JS. So Phantom JS is a uh, is Similar to Mechanize, but it's in JavaScript, so it runs in a browser, um, and it has all the uh, abilities of running on the client-side code already. So if everything is in a JavaScript structure or if you need to run some JavaScript code, that was a question. Uh, PhantomJS would work. It's really nice. I hate it. Um, <laughs> but that's because I don't like throwing heavy machinery in this. and. Um, I find that usage of PhantomJS has never gave me any strength over the tools that I'm already using. All of the code that I've seen of PhantomJS was uh, either doing the exact same thing that I would do with Mechanize, or it, le uh, it, it uses a, a website that was built to be inaccessible. And then it, it's a problem with the website, not with me. And I find ways around it, but that it, it's, pe people oftentimes use PhantomJS, and it proliferates, I think, the problem of having shitty websites from an accessibility point of view. And you know, it's just JavaScript. Let's do everything in JavaScript. Everyone, no, not everyone uses it. I use eLinks sometimes. It's a, it's a, it's a terminal browser. I like it. It's very good. <laughs> you know? um, but people really work hard in making shit inaccessible because they think it's kind of like Flash. Flash, when it was the highlight, Everyone used Flash for everything? Oh, it's everywhere. It's great. Let's just use that. It's perfectly accessible. No, it isn't. You know, my brother still doesn't run Flash. So, yeah. OK. That's it. Any other brave souls? One. Uh, hello. Hello. Thank you for your speech. Uh, Thank you. Do you have something to say about WWW Selenium model on CPAP? Selenium. So, okay, that, that's yeah. actually, I should have, I should no, have no, covered uh, that. Uh, I'm talking about an actual WWW Selenium model, not, not, not about PhantomJS. No, no, no that's, that's actually a good question. But I, I, with your permission, I will tie that in with uh, PhantomJS as well. So there is another way of doing, if you're doing, um, 
tests that are looking at the uh, behavior of a website rather than the correctness of a website. So for example, you want to take a look at, um, will this open a box that I can click on and do stuff like that, Some, something visual specifically. Um, there, there is um, Selenium. Selenium is a framework that actually monitors what you're doing, and then you can run that script again on a browser. It has support for several browsers, and it's very good. Uh, I've used it at a company. Um, and it's really nice because you type the text and you have a full browser in the entire thing. There's a, a pro module for, for it. They, they have a bunch. Um, the pro one is WWW Selenium. Um, I know that uh, at a company where we use it, someone actually moved to writing Perl because the PHP one would just sec fault. I don't know. So they just switched to the Perl one. And um, it's a very good one. PhantomJS, I think, hooks up to that as well. So um, it's very good, but it's mostly for uh, behavior rather than correctness. Web scraping is meant to get data, where Selenium is meant to run stuff like, we would run our reservation tests on it. So we would open the page, put in our code, and that would fill in all the pages, and we would click Next a few times, and all these things. Although those we could write with Mechanize as well. But we wanted to check if, there's like, if the link is not there because the, the, the web design people just threw it off the window, which happened once. Uh, or some pop-up box came on, and then you couldn't you couldn't see anything. So we, we tested those kind of things with it. And then Selenium is uh, superb. <sighs> OK. Uh, OK. Yeah, sure. That's, that's good timing. Uh, have you ever thought about the speed it works with? I about mean, what? About speed it works with. I mean, which one is faster? Speed. Speed. Wow. Yes. Um, well, no. <laughs> Thinking about it hard, no, I haven't. Um, I, I, I will say that generally uh, the Japanese hackers aim towards speed um, tremendously, but I haven't tested any of them, so I don't know which would be faster. Mechanize is not that fast; it's not blazingly fast, um, so I don't I don't know. I've never tested it because it never bothered me. Usually, what bothers me is the I/O. So the path, and this is correct for almost everything that you do. Um, in a program. If you're not doing graphics or any other CPU intensive tasks, the entire slowdown would be I.O. It would be because you're going to a website, you're going to a file system, you're going to something like that. Um, and this would be the slowdown here. The slowness here would literally be go to the website, um, not parsing it. CPU tasks are very, very easy unless you're doing CPU intensive stuff. Yes. I uh, remember one more question. Uh, could you rewind uh, to the slide when uh, you show web query with I.O.? Web query with uh, I.O. I.O.? Uh, do you mean any event? No. Uh, all, you mean I.O.? I.O., yes. Um, uh, it's somewhere. I.O. is actually I.O. all. Um, which is a very nice there module. There was a science, uh, uh, more or less. Mean, it's somewhere, probably in the, yeah, I'm yes, going to. Yes, it's OK. Yeah, I'll take the other one, because it shows as much as possible, I think. There we go. So um, I.O. Oh, here? Yeah, yeah yes, yes, yes. OK, here uh, we see I.O. is overloaded object. Oh, yeah. So I.O. Um, is I.O. all, which I would never advise to use in production, because it basically has overload in and out everywhere. And it overloads the greater than. And what it does is fetch, and it actually says, oh, this is a link. No problem. I'll fetch the link. Oh, this is a file. I'll read the file. Oh, this is a whatever. I'll go to the socket. It's kind of crazy like that, which is very nice, but also kind of scary for production stuff. So I wouldn't use it for production. And then it, uh, realizes the href there is a link, it downloads it, and then it has an overloaded greater than. And then the second IO uh, sees that it's a file, so it opens the file to writing because of the overloading, and then it writes that into the file, which is a really nice way of saying, get the thing and, and throw it into the file, but you will never see this in my production code. Um, okay. It uses IO all and IO all HTTP, which is another small plugin to make it aware of HTTP um, links. This version is uh, at least oak, uh, but uh, that version where where it is a my var 
less than I/O. Yeah, it's there's, scary. there's, uh, you can open the the Perl doc for I/O all, and there's a bunch of stuff. I was told recently that there's a bunch of new people working on I/O all to make it much more sane. So I'll say that much. Okay, last okay. question. Um, yeah, I think we're out of time. Uh, if you want to grab me later, I will be hiding somewhere. Um, and thank you very much for having me. Thank you very much for lasting. And I'll see you around.